fine. We'll look at it again. You ever have one of those projects where it all goes wrong, you don't know how to fix it, and you want to give up, but just can't? After my Daystar Genesis MP stopped working and my efforts to revive it failed, I wanted to move on, but there was something that told me I needed to take another crack at it. Its rare processor card with four PowerPC CPUs is what I was pretty sure was the source of the problem, but I needed to definitively prove that. While I'd earlier tested the voltage rail from the power supply that feeds it and found it to be looking okay, I decided I needed to test it again under load. So that big CPU card went back in, but without its support bracket so I could access the appropriate pins from the back of the PCB. The problem I was chasing is that this machine didn't want to boot, and it was still doing that. But my multimeter was showing almost exactly 3.3 volts. That's perfectly in spec, and means that it's definitely not a power supply problem. The other thing it could be is the motherboard, and while I'd tried swapping in a spare previously, it didn't work because I didn't have the right ROM module. But I still needed to confirm that the motherboard wasn't the cause of the problem, so I pulled it out again. Working inside the Daystar's case looks easy at a glance, but it's actually rather frustrating, not the least of which due to all its sharp metal edges. So I dug another board out of storage, one from a Power Mac 9500. It was almost identical to the one in the Genesis MP because Daystar had collaborated with Apple when designing both machines. This 9500 board had a full complement of RAM modules, but critically also had the ROM chips it needed. It fit in the case perfectly due to the two machines shared lineage and all the wiring hooked up where it needed to. I installed the video card, then went for broke by dropping in the quad CPU board. It's still not going to work, is it? No, it didn't, but it also didn't even power on this time. And here's why. This two-wire harness must be for the power button. I couldn't connect it because one of the tiny differences in the 9500 board is that it lacks that header. There's a small tact switch in its place though, and pressing it got the computer to power on. But sure enough, no startup chime. Just to make sure the board itself was okay, I swapped the quad CPU card with a dual CPU one that I knew was good. I pressed the button again, and the machine roared to life. It had been set to a ridiculous resolution for its era, 1920 by 1200, so I knocked it down to 800 by 600 so things could be legible. I was curious about the RAM, so I opened about this computer to find it had 832 megabytes, an absolutely insane amount for the mid-90s when the 9500 shipped. So both motherboards behaved the same, but a thought crossed my mind. Just because the hardware was identical didn't mean that the ROM was the same between the 9500 and Genesis. Maybe there was some extra code that supported four CPUs specifically that Apple didn't include in the 9500. I ran a program called ROM Grabber to dump the 9500's ROM to a file and saved it to my external blue SCSI. I reinstalled the original motherboard and did the same again, then transferred both files to my modern Mac. I opened them in a hex editor, then had it list the differences. And while there were a number of them, each wasn't very substantial, just a few bytes here and there. I would have expected perhaps some big blocks of code in the Genesis ROM to support the additional processors, but my educated guess was that these differences were really just normal bug fixes that had gotten added over time. So that really suggested the quad CPU card was the problem. I checked the surface mount caps on the back to see if any had failed short, but they all looked okay. I pulled the heatsink off again and inspected around all four processors again, 
just to see if I had missed something again. And I had one small bit between two pins that could have been a solder bridge, but I couldn't tell for sure. So I reflowed those legs anyway and kept looking for more signs of trouble. The CPU board has an important auxiliary chip on it. I can't exactly say what it is because it doesn't have any markings, but my suspicion is that it does some kind of multiplexing of the CPU signal so they can pass through the edge connector to the motherboard. I found a couple of spots where there looked to be some old thermal paste near its pins, and I carefully cleaned it up. I had noticed previously that the pressure from the heatsink was causing the CPU card to warp a bit. To test if that was a factor, I reinstalled the card into the Genesis without it, and very briefly powered the machine on. But no luck. I knew that the motherboard worked with other CPUs and that the power supply was operating fine, so something else that could keep a CPU from working is the lack of a clock signal. The quad CPU card has a crystal oscillator on it, rated for 44 megahertz, which was this machine's bus speed. It's a through-hole part, so I could probe the legs on the bottom of the board, but because of its location, I wouldn't be able to access it easily when installed inside the case. Instead, I soldered a piece of enameled wire to the signal pin on the oscillator, then taped it down to secure it. I don't need to use it often, but these kinds of situations are why I bought an oscilloscope. It should be able to tell me if the crystal is working, so I got it all hooked up and powered the Genesis on while watching the screen. Then this happened. Whoa, what? Wait, what? Wait, so with the probe hooked up, Now you chime. With the probe hooked up, now it chimes. Was it a crystal issue the whole time? Yeah, it kind of seems like it, huh? It certainly wasn't obvious at all under the microscope, but as far as I could tell, simply soldering that jumper wire to the pad by the crystal's signal pin, reflowing it in the process, was enough to get the CPU card working again. Kind of a weird place for that to happen, but I'll take it. And a cracked solder joint would certainly explain the intermittent behavior I'd previously been seeing before the card ultimately stopped working. Reseating it would get the computer to boot again, and doing so would probably flex the PCB just enough to restore contact. I wanted to leave the machine running for a while, so that meant the heatsink needed to go back on. Wait a minute, y'all think I'm stupid? I was really hoping this would be the last time I'd have to do this. I got it reinstalled in the Genesis and did a quick power on test to make sure it was still working. Wait, what the f- Yeah, it wasn't. Clearly that oscillator wasn't the source of the problem after all. Just a red herring. The heatsink came off again, then I put the bear card back in, and... It's the f***ing heatsink! So, my fear was that the flex in the PCB caused by the heatsink had cracked some internal traces where I couldn't see or fix them. These spring clips are what keep the CPU dies pressed against the heatsink, so I decided to remove them to see if that made a difference. They're a massive pain to work with, but eventually I got them all popped free. So the Mac chimes without a heatsink. What would happen if I just set it on top without securing it? That's really weird. How about removing it again? I think I'm losing my mind. A thought was that the heatsink might be shorting something out it shouldn't. But these square pads on the PCB are what the heatsink press against, and the heatsink has matching square legs. Furthermore, those pads are tied to the ground plane of the board, so it does seem like the heatsink itself is supposed to be grounded. 
Without those spring clips, the heatsink doesn't even touch the dies of the CPUs or any other components. So I think that rules that idea out. Earlier, sometimes the PCB without its heatsink didn't boot though. What about that? I got it to do it again, though I wasn't sure how. So I tried flexing the board gently by hand while powering the machine on. Huh, what if I let it go? Now we're getting somewhere. Clearly it's this corner of the board that's affected. So I poked at these components to see if I could cause and fix the problem on demand. And I could. These are passive delay modules, and the presence of four of them suggests there's one per CPU. If one or more of these wasn't working, that could certainly keep the machine from booting. I gently pressed each one to make sure it was soldered down firmly, but then I got to the third one. Whoa. Can you see it? Yeah, this lead is broken off the board. It's the kind of thing that would cause an intermittent connection if the PCB flexed, don't you think? I got it resoldered, then did the rest of the legs on the other parts just for good measure. I dropped it back into the Genesis to test again, and... Well, that's certainly promising, but the only way to know for sure was to put it all back together. Would it still work with the heatsink fully attached? Finally, after all that work, it was done. That broken component leg was the issue all along. What a stupid problem to have, and I felt foolish to have missed it all this time. But the Genesis was booting, and its control panel was reporting all four CPUs were working as they should. In hindsight, of course, my gut was right. I shouldn't have given up on this thing earlier, and taking a more analytical troubleshooting approach from the beginning would have saved me a lot of time. But this super rare vintage Mac clone is back in action now and that's all that matters. What's more, that broken solder joint was likely the cause of this machine's flakiness since even before I got it. It's a huge relief to know that this Genesis MP should be reliable going forward, and more importantly, that it's been saved from the scrap heap of history. So I'm selling it.